Nixon said, I'm pulling the 9th Infantry back. So my mother wrote, she says, well, the 9th Infantry's coming back, but where are you at? Well, they ran all our supplies through the 25th Infantry so they could pretend the 9th was no longer there. But three brigades were left behind. I knew that as soon as I was going to finish my student teaching, they're probably going to draft me because I had checked with my draft board in my hometown and my number was kind of at the top of the list. And I didn't like the idea of being drafted, so I stopped in Billings, Montana and talked to the Army recruiter and said, let's get this over with. The training I went through, though, was a little different than probably the way they train nowadays. When I went into basic and advanced infantry training in Fort Lewis, Washington, it was bad in the fact that it was the coldest winter they had in record in 80 years, and they're training us for jungle warfare. That didn't help out a lot. But all our training cadre were returning combat vets. So they were passing on the information, this is what you need to know to survive Vietnam. So we had a lot of expertise, and as well as they could prepare us, they, they did. Give me the infantry and give me the Vietnam. It's one of the few times in my life somebody actually gave me what I asked for. <laughs> I think our battalion average was, uh, point man lasted one to two months and they were killed or wounded. The guys used to call me third LT because eventually I ended up walking point for seven months. It wasn't a matter of being brave or courageous. I didn't want someone else to trip a booby trap, hit a wire, and then I walk by and I'm the one that gets blown up. In peacetime, a platoon has maybe 50 guys. In combat, maybe 25 to 35. Over there, the first six months I was there, we never had more than six or seven guys. They got killed and wounded faster than we could get replacements. Probably 80% of our wounded were not direct fire, which means it wasn't a bullet. They were from booby traps and booby traps tend to be really messy. World War II, the French, us, Vietnam had known something like 50 years of combat. It was like a big whorehouse. But if you get out in the rural areas and you meet the farmers and some of those people, it was, it was quite a bit different. But then probably at nighttime, some of those farmers that was giving you bananas and tea during the day were probably setting up tripwires at night, so you never knew. And I like Vietnamese people. I liked them a lot. I killed a lot of them, but that's because I was out in the boonies and they were shooting at me. They take us in by helicopter, so I'd be on the first chopper and be standing out on the runner, so as soon as they hit the ground, I'm, I'm off and I'm the first one into the wood line. We had a new lieutenant one time. I used to call him I won't mention his name because he lost two legs later, but I used to call him at the time Boy Wonder. See, I'd walk like 75 to 100 yards in front of everybody else. I looked for the booby traps and ambushes, and his very first day in the field, he's right on my ass because he wants to shoot a gook really, really bad. I found seven, eight, nine tripwires that day. It was along the plain of reeds along the Cambodian border. 
and, and end of the day, he was walking the end of the line. Didn't want to be anywhere, anywhere near me. But it used to make him nervous because I, I never wore my glasses in the field when I was looking for booby traps. But when we get back to base camp, I cuss and swear who had my goddamn glasses because I can't see to draw. <laughs> it used to bother him a little bit. He says, you don't need it to find tripwires, but how come you need it to draw? For every 25 combat assault missions on a helicopter, you got an air medal. I have four air medals, but I had enough combat assault missions for six. So that meant, well, I had 150 insertions in combat on choppers. And when I left, the company clerk said, well, do you want me to turn in the paperwork for the last two? And I says, you know, I already got four. What do I need two more for? So this one day, we'd been pulling search and destroy all day long, and we were tired and we were exhausted. And we were at our pickup zone, and we were waiting for the choppers to come and get us. And an officer came over. He says, well, they called in, and they're going to pick up another platoon first, so it might take another 30 minutes before they get to us. There's another wood line again. He wanted to go check it out. Says, we've done our job today. We're going back. We got a stand down tonight. We don't have to go to the field tomorrow. And he got mad at me and says, You stay here. So he just took three guys with him. And Pancho was from Puerto Rico. He only had three days left in the army. He bought a new car. He sent his girlfriend a ring. And he's going to get married. As soon as they walked into the wood line, we heard gunfire. Charlie was in the spider hole with an AK-47. And the rest of us got up and we ran just as fast as we could. We got there and there's Poncho laying on the ground. Most of his face was gone. Part of his lips, the bullets had gone up through the front and you could see part of his teeth and part of his lips, and then the bone from, from here had blown out his eyes. But he was still alive. We carried him, put him on the chopper, and then I says, you know, someone's gonna die for this. And then the other guys in the outfit, well, let's hang him in a tree and we'll carve him up and leave the son of a bitch there. And something snapped in my head and I says, no, we're, we're civilized. We do not torture people. And the guy was begging for his life in English, and he was probably, once I raised my rifle up, two feet in front of it, and I just emptied a whole magazine down the front of him. No blood. It's like you see pictures of a shark attacking something, and big, just took big, big chunks out of him. And then what ruined my life was I found in, a, in his pocket a small, small black and white photograph with a little writing on the back. It was his 19-year-old wife and three-month-old daughter. And then, and then suddenly, well, that didn't bring, that didn't bring Poncho back. Boy, we really accomplished a lot all the way around. Come on, girls. From then on, it haunted me that there's a little girl. She'd be. 35 now, grew up without a father. And, and so of all the things that haunt me the worst was that, that, that photo haunts me a lot. And uh, that I can draw you a portrait of that young girl and the baby to this day. She still lets me pick her up. She let me pick her up and carry her because I picked her up and held her ever since she was a baby. Oh, you want something? Look, see, we learned an army have to go a little bit crazy so he didn't go complete crazy. But things which you might think bad or surreal here were everyday oh, life yes, there. Yes, it's a really good stuff. You're a pretty girl. Oh, are you going to share? <laughs> a lot of those people, they were just serving their country too, and it was their country. <laughs> I'm graceful. Come here, darling. Come here, darling. Look what I got. People who were doing the fighting and the killing 
Yeah, they hated the good. war more than anybody. Yeah, pretty good. It was just yeah. politicians doing their voodoo. No, nobody won anything. There you go, Harry. Uh, My cousin called up and said, hey, we got a teaching job. You want to come teach Navajo and Hopi kids art? Uh, sounded good. Went home and talked to my wife. Three days later, I resigned, quit my job. We got a U-Haul, and we moved to, to the city. What kind of teacher was I? Well, let's say I was a bit unorthodox. You know, I used to have a couple teachers every year file charges against me. I thought I was going to kill them or something like that. See, so I guess my bad attitude from Nam, my thing with adults doesn't work out very well. People used to be amazed when I was teaching, how can you get along with kids so well? I don't feel threatened by kids. They're usually smarter than adults, and there's more hope for them. Frequently, I had people who personally did not like me I told them earlier, I said, I'm an artist teaching art. So I'm not going to their level, they're going to my level. And they did. In fact, I used to average 40 to 50 kids a class. Any student who was kicked out of any other class, I would never say no. They were a real challenge, but sometimes they turned out to be my best students. And I had one parent come in and their son was into Satanism. The kid was really, very smart, really bright. He was beating up his little sister and threatened to kill his father. So would I please beat the shit out of him? Because I'm the only one he'll listen to and I'm the only one he's afraid of. And so I says, well, let me see what I can do. The shop teacher, Woody Begay, he was my bud. And Woody Begay came in smiling. I don't believe it. Parents come in, they ask you to beat the crap out of their son. But I had a system when I would jump on kids. I already had the counselors, deans, social workers. See, I'd have this whole group of people. I'm just going to crack the shell, and I'm going to run them through all kinds of people. And I didn't sleep for several days. I'm waiting. I, I know he's going to mess up. You know, when he mess up, I'm going to jump with both feet. So he came in and messed up. I, I forgot what he specifically did, but it was something really out of line. And I put on a show. I grabbed him and I had his feet off the floor and we were rattling that metal door. If he did this anymore, what I was going to do to him and all the other kids were sitting there in total shock. And then I put him down and took him to my office. I says, you know, your parents talked to me. He says, yeah, I know they've already okayed for you to beat the crap out of me. So I says, you do anything to your sister, your father, you don't work hard in school, oh, I got your ass, it's mine. He believed me. You know, you, you're never mad. It's good to pretend you're mad sometimes. There's no way I would do that to a kid, but he didn't know that. See this scar that runs all the way here? Mm. I slipped and cut all the way through. You can see the skin on the other side. And that one, I shoved the point out through the other side. And that one I cut from here to here all the way to the bone and that's why it doesn't close very well. Whenever he'd be good, I'd give him extra art supplies. When he wouldn't be good, I'd get on his case. And he did really good. He did great artwork. And he was doing good in all his other classes. And everything was taken care of. And I didn't see him for four years, something like that. 
And finally, I ran into him at a basketball game. He was home and came over and gave me a hug and shook my hand and told me he was graduating from college and he thanked me for everything I did for him. That's my job to teach those kind of things too. I says, if they don't have their head and their heart in the right place, how can I teach them any art? I gotta deal with the whole person. That was something I learned from my Chinese professors. But it was tiring. <laughs> I got too old to do it. The Navajo people, they really had a great respect for vets. I think the things I dealt with when I came back felt harder than what I dealt with over there. How dare me, I, I came back, I was a Vietnam vet, and I brought the first Chinese girl to my hometown. And I get phone calls three, four o'clock in the morning, how Susie Wong, how much money she charging. And then they had it both ways. They call me Me Lai Murder, but then because I married a Chinese girl, they call me Gook Lover. Vietnam War was one thing. Dealing with America when we came back was something else. I wonder how many of the guys I know, are they still alive? Are they drug addicts? Are they alcoholics? The data on Vietnam vets is really, really horrible. When they were sending me to all these psychiatrists and trying to determine if I had PTSD, they said they were used to guys feeling bad about fellow soldiers dying, which I felt. But they said they'd never run into somebody who felt bad about the Vietnamese he'd killed. When I first come back, my mother, the very first morning she walked in and woke me up screaming. I had to sleep with a handgun in my hand where I couldn't sleep at night. See, I, I refight Vietnam every night. I do it during the day when I'm having conversations with other people. It intrudes. It's always there. I don't know what I did this morning, but if you want to go back there, I can tell you everything that happened. See, this is, it hasn't rotted. This is cane material. I cut away the white to get to the red core, but this is, this is great for cane. And if it's not too rotten, this is cedar here, too. So if I couldn't sleep, then I, I just funneled all my energy into, to, to art, so I think the, the art's kept me alive. It's a nice, hear the sound? That means the core's in good shape. And then I can carve off the top pieces. So sometimes when I'm depressed or feeling most angry, sometimes that's when I do my most artwork or some of my best artwork. I guess it started in Nam. I was kind of interested in the medium and materials. At first I would do western things with those mediums, but then slowly I was drawing more water buffaloes and Asian people. I don't paint sunshiny days. There are always stormy, rainy clouds, storms, dark skies. It wasn't something I planned, it just kind of went that way. And, and a lot of the people, including my parents, they didn't like my artwork. I don't like the world around me, so I don't paint it. So I create my own world. Of course, growing up in Wyoming, it was Frederick Remington and Charlie Russell. If it wasn't Western art, it wasn't artwork. While I was stationed in Vietnam, my two R&Rs I took, I went to Taiwan. I was eating Chinese food and I was going to the Palace Museum every day so I could see all this great artwork. And I visited with the president of the university. Can I just come here for a year? I just want to get all the art I can get. And he says, sounds great. As far as I know, I'm the first and only American ever accepted as a graduate art student in the University of Chinese Culture in Taiwan, up in Yangmansong Mountain. My other teachers, they were some of the old masters from mainland China, so it was really a unique opportunity, and they did everything humanly possible to help me. The Chinese government invited me back. This is when I was teaching in, on the Navajo Reservation in Tuba City. Some Chinese people thought I'd kind of invented a new style of Chinese painting, so I had, like, one summer, seven shows in seven cities. The new 
newspapers and TVs and magazines, and my wife had to threaten to divorce me every day to keep me going because it was driving me out of my mind. When I was going to school in Taiwan, they'd say, well, not bad for an American, but your work looks very Western. And then when I go to the University of Wyoming, they'd say, well, your work looks pretty good, but it looks very Oriental. Not the brush. I used to tell students, artists don't do art because they want to. They do it because they have to. I don't want to paint the world around me. I don't want to interpret the world around me. I want to paint the world that I create in my own imagination. I'm going to paint my own world. I see a lot of guys with PTSD have bad memories and they're amazed that I could remember so much and visually I remember so much. In fact, the psychologist I went to, Brian, he says, you know, Tom, you're always building a wall. Maybe once in a while, you might just peek your head or go look out there, there's a world out, outside of this wall. A couple weeks later, I showed up with this really large Chinese ink and watercolor painting. It's called Tom's World. I said, the last thing I want to talk about is Vietnam. So we talk about art. And, and all the things that we talked about, I put in the painting. There's an ape with a harlequin hat. That's me. It's my wife's portrait in the little sphere. But he says, boy, that doorway sure is a hell of a long way down the hallway, and it's really, really a tiny door. But I says, well, at least that's, that's the biggest concession I can give you. And he says, well, you ever going to use that key and go outside that door? I says, not if I can help it. <laughs> My birds. Four years ago, I didn't have any birds, two dogs. Now I got two dogs, a chinchilla, and 30 birds. For a guy who grew up in Wyoming and South Dakota is considered east, I never thought I'd be in North Carolina. And I like it a lot. I live in a small town called Graham. And, and after all the years of desert, I love all the green. And I discovered all the great cedar wood, so I, I was going to quit sculpture, but now I took up some carving again. And my daughter married a farmer, so if I have a bad day, I go see his cows and goats. I just go walk through the woods and hang out on the farm. I have uh, my yard, I have my daughter's farm, and I got my birds. There's, there's my, my social life.